Welcome back to NSO and to our last and final webcast. We hope you've enjoyed our posts so far and hopefully this one will be no different. Today we're joined by a very special guest. Dr. Rick Feinberg is from the American Astronomical Society and he's going to walk us through a step-by-step -step guide on what to expect on the day of the solar eclipse. But first, we have some reminders for you. If you haven't got one yet, it's time to make your plan for observing the eclipse. What tools are you going to use? If you haven't gotten eclipse glasses, best do it soon. If you're making a pinhole viewer, go for it. If you have a telescope with no solar filter, you should plan to use projection rather than looking through the eyepiece. If you want to get a solar filter, we recommend calling the telescope manufacturer and asking for their recommendation. Remember, the solar filter should be in good condition and in good quality, and they should fit your telescope. Any stray light could cause serious damage to your eyes. Make sure you have a plan for small children on Eclipse Day as well. You can go outside today with your solar viewing glasses and practice with them. Remember, put them on first, then look up at the sun, and remember to look away from the sun before you take them off. Remember that solar filters should always be on the front end of your instrument. It's not safe to put on solar viewing glasses and look through an unfiltered telescope. The solar filter must be on the front end of your telescope. If you are not going to totality, you're going to need eye protection all the time. If you are in the path of totality, it will be safe to look directly at the sun unfiltered for the time between the diamond rings. That is, while the surface of the sun is completely covered by the moon. If even 1% of the surface of the sun is showing, you need eye protection. That's how bright the sun is. The sun won't be doing anything different on eclipse day. All that will be changing is the amount of sunlight reaching the surface of the earth along the path of totality and impartiality. There won't be any special types of radiation coming down to earth and will still be protected by the earth's atmosphere, though it's still a good idea to wear sunscreen. The eclipsed corona is only as bright as the full moon, which is not very bright at all. That's why we can and should look at the corona after the full surface of the sun has been completely covered by the moon. It's the surface light that can be very damaging to our eyes. And that's why we need eye protection for the partial phases of the eclipse. This is true whether you're in the path of totality or not. Now we'll pass you over to our special guest for a step-by-step -step guide on what to expect on eclipse day. Hi, I'm Rick Feinberg. I'm the press officer for the American Astronomical Society and former editor-in-chief of Sky and Telescope. And I've had the good fortune over the past uh, 25 years or so to, to visit uh, countries all over the world to see total solar eclipses. I've now seen 12, so the one in August 2017 will be my 13th, uh, lucky 13. So you'll hear a lot about how on August 21st there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun in the United States. And that's true, but there's also going to be a partial eclipse. And this is something that I'm always trying to convey to people, is that the total eclipse only lasts a couple of minutes. But for about an hour and a half or so on either side, there will be a partial eclipse as the moon slowly covers more and more of the sun before it completely uh, blocks it all. And then for another hour and a half or so afterwards. And safety is of paramount concern during the partial phases. But during the total phase, when the moon is completely blocking the sun's bright face, it is perfectly okay, in fact it's mandatory, that you look at the sun. The totally eclipsed sun is just about as bright as the full moon. And it's just as safe to look at. You can look at it with your eyes, you can look at it through binoculars, you can look at it with a telescope, it's perfectly safe. But when the moon has not completely covered the sun and any part of the sun's ordinary bright face is still visible, even a thin sliver, the intensity of that light is so great that if you don't use proper viewing technique, you could injure your eyes. Um, there are two basic ways to look at a partial solar eclipse. One is directly, where you use a special filter that blocks all the harmful solar radiation and allows you to have a nice comfortable view of the sun. And the other is to use an indirect method, sometimes called projection, where instead of looking right at the sun, you project an image of the sun, either with a pinhole or with a telescope or binoculars, and look at the projected image, which is not very bright at all. So let me describe for you what will happen on August 21st. And what will happen will depend critically on whether you're in the path of totality or outside the path. If you are not in the path of totality, and you're only going to have a partial eclipse, 
you might not even realize that it's already begun. Because when the moon starts to block the bright sun, there's still so much sun visible that the daylight remains as bright as it is when there's no eclipse happening. It's only if you're very close to the path and you get a very deep partial eclipse, something like 80%, 90%, that you would ever even notice that the sky was getting at all darker than it is on a usual sunny day. About an hour and a half before the time of total eclipse, the moon will take its first little bite out of the sun. You'll begin to have a partial eclipse. And during this partial eclipse, which will last about an hour and a half, you have to use a safe viewing method to look at the sun because the bright face is still visible and it will hurt your eyes if you don't use some kind of protection. At first, it's just a little bite taken out of the sun and you might not even notice. But over time, over the next hour or so, the moon will steadily encroach on more and more of the sun's face and if you're looking through a safe solar filter, you will see the sun begin to take on a crescent shape. And it's really quite dramatic. Uh, but it happens slowly. It takes, like I said, almost an hour and a half for the moon to completely cover the sun. If you weren't already aware of the fact that a solar eclipse was happening, you might not even realize it because unless 80 or 90 percent of the sun is covered, it feels like an ordinary bright sunny day. It's only that last bit, maybe the last 20 minutes or so before totality, where the landscape begins to take on a different feel and the sunlight begins to change its character. So what I like to do during the partial phases is to uh, experience some of the things that happen that are very different than on an ordinary day. When the sun is partially eclipsed, if you look, for example, under a tree, a nice leafy tree, you'll see little dapples of sunlight on the ground and you'll realize, hey, they're shaped like crescents because the, the uh, little holes between the leaves are projecting pinhole images of the sun on the ground and they take on the shape of the sun, which at the moment is partially eclipsed, so it looks like a crescent. Um, another thing that's interesting to do, uh, especially as you get to about t minus 15 minutes, is look to the west or the northwest. You'll begin to see that very distant clouds are getting dark, if there are any clouds. If there are no clouds, you'll just notice that the distant horizon looks kind of murky or, or um, dusky. And that's because you're seeing the dark inner shadow of the moon on the distant horizon. And it's approaching at a couple thousand miles an hour, but it still takes a few minutes before it gets to you. But you'll see that if you remember to look. Also, at about 10 to 15 minutes before totality, the sky begins to get a little bit darker. It starts to feel like sunset or twilight. And for this particular eclipse, the very brilliant planet Venus will become visible. It'll be uh, to the upper right or to the right of the sun um, by about the width of your uh, outstretched fingers. And that's pretty dramatic because suddenly you realize, oh look, the stars are coming out. Now of course Venus is a planet, but as it continues to get dark, additional planets and some of the brighter stars may become visible too. So now as we're getting to about five to ten minutes before, the sun is a thin sliver of a crescent. Now you look at this with your safe solar filters, you'll see that thin crescent. If you look around at you at the daylight, it still feels like pretty much like daylight. That shadow looming to the northwest is getting closer. Uh, it's noticeably darker in that part of the sky, but it's still broad daylight. But if you look down at the ground at your own shadow, because the sun is now a very thin crescent, it's almost acting like a star. It's becoming a point. And so it starts to twinkle. And your shadow starts to get very, very sharp on the ground because you've got essentially a point, a point of sunlight rather than a big ball of sunlight casting very sharp shadows on the ground. You'll see individual hairs on your head or in a case like me where there's not too many, I look at the shadow of the hairs on my arms um, and they stand out crystal clear. And in the last couple minutes before totality, because of that twinkling effect, you will sometimes see wavy alternating lines of dark and light. These are called shadow bands and it's literally twinkling sunlight. 
They're not always easy to see. I've only seen them once or twice myself in the dozen eclipses I've been to. It helps if you have uh, a very light colored surface, if you're like you have a sidewalk or maybe the wall of a building next to you, something like that, you might see them. It's just in the last couple of minutes before totality. Now this is when things really get exciting and it feels like time is speeding up. A whole bunch of phenomena begin to occur in very rapid succession. And it's hard not to uh, sort of get overexcited and, and maybe forget what it was you wanted to do during the total eclipse. You might start to, to lose your mind a little bit because so many things are happening at once. But here's the sequence. So you're looking at the sun through your safe solar filters, whether you're using binoculars or a telescope or just naked eye. The moon is on the verge of covering the last bits of the sun. Now the moon doesn't have a smooth edge. It has mountains and valleys. When there's only a very thin hairline crescent left, mountains and valleys on the edge of the moon begin to slice into that crescent and break it up. And you get what are called Bailey's beads. You get the last few bits of sunlight shining through the deepest valleys on the edge of the moon. And you see this little string of beads called Bailey's beads for astronomer Francis Bailey, who first described them in the late 1700s. And when there's only one left, the inner bright corona, the sun's outer atmosphere, begins to become visible around the opposite limb of the sun. And if you look at that moment, you see one bright bead, which looks like a diamond, and very faint inner corona around the rest of the moon's limb looks like the band of a ring. This is called the diamond ring effect. It occurs at the very beginning of totality and again at the very end. It's one of the most beautiful sights in all of nature. It only lasts a fraction of a second. When that last bead disappears, that's when you can take off your solar filters. And at that point, you're struck by this most awesome sight. The sun's outer atmosphere, or corona, which is always there, but always hidden in the glare of the bright everyday sun, suddenly becomes visible. We never know exactly what it's going to look like. It's different at every eclipse because the sun's outer atmosphere is dynamic. It's controlled by the sun's magnetic field, which is always changing. But you will typically see very bright inner corona and streamers spreading away in different directions. And you will see, uh, you will effectively see what look like uh, the magnetic field lines that you see if you sprinkle iron filings around a bar magnet or a horseshoe magnet. You'll see the, um, the sunlight is not just uh, diffuse, it's got lines radiating in all directions. It's really quite striking. And it's a different kind of light than ordinary sunlight. It's more like fluorescent light. Uh, the light is shining at a number of specific wavelengths from ions in the gas out there in the corona, uh, but it's not like uh, ordinary sunlight, which is like, a, uh, like an incandescent bulb. So it's a different light. The color of the sky is typically like deep twilight. The corona itself usually looks white, though some people have described seeing bluish color or greenish color in it. Um, it's very dramatic. And during that period, when the corona is visible, Again, perfectly safe to look without any filters. If you have binoculars, use them. You'll be able to see a lot of detail that isn't visible to your naked eye. And you will, if you then look back with your naked eye and look up around the sun, well, first of all, the moon is blacker than black. It's, uh, you know, the silhouette against the corona and the blue sky, it, it, it really looks like a black hole in the heavens. It's, it's quite astonishing. And it helps draw the contrast between the blackness of the moon's silhouette and the blue sky around. At different eclipses it gets uh, different levels of twilight darkness. Because this eclipse is not particularly long and the moon's inner shadow is only about 70 miles wide, it probably won't get super dark, but it'll still be like twilight. And what you will see if you look around with your naked eye, not binoculars or a telescope, but your naked eye, you will see Venus, possibly Jupiter, you will see some of the brighter stars. You may not be able to tell which ones they are because there's only a few and you don't know which constellations they're part of, but you'll see stars in the daytime, which is kind of weird. The other thing that you'll notice, if you keep your wits about you, if there are any animals around, maybe it's just birds, maybe it's insects, but if you're observing with family uh, and you've got pets around, or maybe you're in a rural area and there's some uh, skunks or possums or other kinds of animals around, they're going to act as if it's sunset. If you're on a farm, you're going to suddenly notice that the sheep and the pigs and the cows are all kind of heading to the barn. Because as far as they're concerned, it's sunset. 
If there's bats around, out they come, looking for dinner. They think it's sunset. Okay, you've only got a maximum of 2 minutes 40 seconds to examine the corona, look for the stars and planets in the daytime sky, try to be aware of the um, animals and people and how they're reacting around you, and then, as quickly as it began, it ends. As the moon begins to uncover the sun, the first deepest valley on that receding limb of the moon lets a little bead of sunlight come through. And you'll see the diamond ring again. This time you'll see it really well because your eyes have gotten a little bit adapted to the dark and you don't have your solar filters on yet. So you'll see this beautiful diamond ring and at that moment you put your filters back on. Then you'll see the diamond turn into two or three or four or five Bailey's beads and then you'll see the thin crescent and then you've got another hour and a half before the eclipse is over. And if you forgot to look at the shadows on the hair on your head or on your arm, or if you forgot that you brought a spaghetti colander out and you meant to use it to project little pinhole crescents on the ground, you've got an hour and a half to do that. So uh, by the time it's over, three hours or so will have transpired. It's only those couple of minutes in the middle with maybe 10 minutes on either side where things are really happening fast and it's very dramatic. But you will definitely want to see another one. And one of the amazing things about this eclipse is after a nearly 40 year drought of having any total eclipse in the continental US, there's going to be another one in just seven years, on April 8th, 2024. It won't cross the country from coast to coast. It comes into the country from Mexico and heads up through Texas and up through Maine and into Canada. But it goes over some really big cities like Dallas, Fort Worth. Potentially even more people will see that one than will see this one. We hope you found our Eclipse webcast useful and hopefully sparked some ideas and understanding for August 21st. As usual, you can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash National Solar Observatory. On Twitter, our handle is at NatSolarObs and on Instagram, we're at National Solar Observatory. We hope you have clear skies on August 21st and have a wonderful eclipse.